mortality by its very nature suggests that all living things have in common a mix of strengths and weaknesses. It follows then that the primary objective shared by all conscientious dog breeders is to improve the quality of their respective breeds. The goal is to breed for a perfect blend of type, genetic integrity, good temperament, and structural soundness. In this endeavor, there's no such thing as a pick of the litter. Although pick of the litter is a common phrase among the dog people, we'd be wise to eliminate it from both our mindset and our vocabulary. What's required is to evaluate each puppy in relation to a standard of structural excellence and the breed standard, rather than evaluating it in relation to its litter mates. To assess breed type in puppies, study your breed standard carefully, bearing in mind what you need in your breeding program to improve type in your lines. However, evaluating type without taking structural quality into consideration will get you nowhere and may put your puppies at risk. The purpose of this videotape is to provide information about evaluating the structural quality of puppies. As breeders, my husband and I made the same kinds of mistakes over the years that every breeder makes. We've all kept puppies we shouldn't have, we've all sold puppies we later wish we'd kept, and we've all placed some puppies with families whose lifestyles were incompatible with the puppy's capabilities. Throughout our involvement in breeding programs, we kept asking ourselves, what are we missing? In our search for answers, we met with Dr. Hal Engel. Dr. Engel heads the anatomy department at Oregon State University's School of Veterinary and Medicine. The exchange of ideas at that meeting started us on a journey plotted by more and more questions. Our research led us from one vet school to another, from general practice vets to orthopedic surgeons, from research facilities to engineers. Each resource provided a piece of the puzzle. Our challenge was to put that puzzle together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have used the process discussed in this tape for several years. My husband and I evaluate an average of 250 litters per year, documenting each evaluation. As a result, we've been able to track the accuracy of our process, which continues to amaze even us. See what it can do for you and for your breeding program. Evaluating for structural soundness is a piece of the formula for success. You have to put it together with breed type, coat, colors, and the status of your breeding program. However, the formula is fundamentally flawed if it excludes the inborn composition of a dog's physical structure. <laughs> Evaluate puppies only at eight weeks, give or take three days either way. This is crucial. Before eight weeks, soft tissue is not sufficiently developed to hold the bone structure in place. As all bones grow at different rates, it's important to realize that the proportion of bone growth is as similar to the adult structure at eight weeks as it's ever going to be during the growth of the puppy. Therefore, what you see, and more importantly, what you feel at eight weeks, is what the puppy will grow into as an adult dog. This applies to all breeds across the board. The only exceptions we have found are premature puppies and puppies that have not had a good start. We've never had consistent results evaluating these two exceptions, so don't even try. Evaluate the whole litter. Keep detailed records on every puppy and every litter you evaluate so that you can make the best possible breeding choices later on. 
It makes no difference if you recognize breed disqualifications or obvious pets among the puppies. Evaluate them all. The real benefit of evaluating litters is education. The more a breeder learns, the more the breed will benefit. Keep a written record of each evaluation. Always record the results of each evaluation in writing. Then, when developing your breeding program, you will have not only pedigrees to consider, but also the added advantage of written evaluation results. The more information you have, the better informed your breeding plans will be. Select an objective grading system. We use a point system of 1 to 5, 5 being the best, 3 being an average dog of its breed that you see in the show ring, and 1 being the least desirable. The reason for an objective grading system is to maintain focus on quality. It's so much easier to get where you want to be in dogs if you breed quality. Subjective grading encourages you to overlook structural weaknesses in favor of the puppy who captures your heart. Maybe its personality is just too cute. Or maybe it possesses a single outstanding element you'd hope the breeding would produce. But what about the puppy as a whole? If you don't work to eliminate structural weaknesses from your breeding program, you will stand still and so will your breed. Produce quality dogs. Then concentrate on type, coat, color, and so forth. The structural evaluation process is used to improve a breeding program, not to proclaim the arrival of the next record-breaking show dog. Bearing that in mind, our recommendation is any puppy that has any structural piece evaluated lower than average should be excluded from your breeding program. If you see no improvement in structural quality and type from what you already have, don't keep any of that litter. If you want to be a top breeder, trying to represent a mediocre dog as great is self-defeating. Try again and keep your sights on quality. Evaluate puppies at a place completely unfamiliar to them. They're too comfortable where they live. They need to be evaluated in a place where they've never been. Another room in your house doesn't count because it all smells the same to puppies. Have someone unfamiliar to the puppies handle them for the evaluation. The worst person to evaluate a litter for its structural quality is the breeder. Let someone working with a different breed evaluate your litters and you evaluate theirs. That way, everyone learns. Evaluate puppies in a mirror. Look at the picture in the mirror, not at the animal in your hands. This is imperative to an objective review. A mirror gives you the opportunity to step away from the puppy without ever having to step away from the puppy. Let your fingertips be your best set of eyes. Your fingertips relay a great deal more information to your brain than your hand or your eye does. That's probably why safe crackers need sensitive fingertips. The most accurate view of a puppy's bone structure and tissue strengths come through tactile contact. Feel for skeleton formations muscle mass, and motion as allowed by ligamentation. It's important to remember never to push past the point of resistance when feeling for motion. Use soft hands, fingertips, and gentle motions. You'll be amazed at how much you can see this way. This puppy is so perfectly balanced. Be consistent in your evaluation steps. It's easy to let personal inclinations color the way you evaluate a litter. 
it's perfectly normal to try to make our favorite puppy look the best. However, in order to achieve the greatest possible accuracy, every puppy must be evaluated the same way with as much objectivity as possible. Attachments and preferences only hinder the benefits of the process. Handle each puppy the same way. Use the same procedure each time with each puppy. Concentrate on getting every puppy in as natural a position as possible. Evaluate the entire litter one puppy at a time. Don't discuss the evaluations yet. Once you've finished your evaluation and recorded all of the gradings and comments on temperament, testicles, mouths, balance, or whatever, determine and write down an overall score for each puppy. Motors the third. Martin's fourth. Then, and this is very important, go over the litter a second time to discuss each puppy. And look at all this in the mirror. See how much in front it's hanging? But this time, take the puppies in order starting with the least quality and working your way up to the best quality puppy. This method will help you develop an eye for perfection and what is correct. To evaluate for grading, we suggest the following procedure. First, check temperament. To evaluate temperament, turn it gently over on its back and cradle it in your arms and against your body. You want to give the puppy every opportunity to feel it's securely held so that what you see is a puppy's genetic temperament traits, not a fear of falling. Next, look at the whole puppy in a suspended position. You need to position the puppy in such a way that it hangs free without bearing any weight and is completely relaxed. Pick a puppy up only on the bone structure of the skull and between the rear legs without touching the testicles if it's a male. In this way, you won't influence anything their body does naturally. If you pick puppies up properly, they will relax and allow it. If you pick them up improperly, they either grab for your arm or fight you. Keep trying until you learn how to do this without stressing the puppy. A well-structured puppy will hang in a very nearly stacked position. That's what you're looking for. If that's not what you see, there is a structural reason. Next, look at the whole puppy in a standing position on the table. Just try to make the puppy stand in a comfortable position. If they fidget, pick them up in the same fashion as you would for a hanging position and run their feet along the table surface a couple of times. Puppies dislike the feel of a surface moving beneath their feet. Once you scrape their feet lightly across the table, they're usually so glad the table isn't moving anymore that they hold still. After the puppy is standing comfortably and balanced on all four legs, the first thing you look at is the overall balance. Resist the temptation to fix the puppy. Just stack it in as natural a position as possible. Remember, the shape of the puppy at eight weeks is the shape it will grow back into as an adult. Check the puppy's proportions in accordance with your breed standard. In other words, check the height in relation to the length and the depth of the body in relation to the height of the leg. Make sure you are following your breed standard as some standards require the dog to be longer than it's tall, have a sloping top line, or so forth. With the puppy comfortably stacked, look at the whole picture. Is there anything that stands out, such as a short neck, no front, or lack of balance? Is the puppy correctly proportioned? If something doesn't look right, search for the cause as you go over each piece. Start with the head. Next, the bite.
and then the occlusion. Move on to the neck. Then the shoulders. The upper arm. The elbows. And the front piece. Then consider front assembly angulation. Then check the depth of chest, length of rib cage and loin. From there move to the rear assembly. Check the hawk angle and then Make sure to also check the height of the hawk. Rear assembly proportions. Fit of the knees. The placement of the feet. Shape of the pelvis, the balance of the muscle mass on the legs, and check the hawk stability. Next check the top line for motion, the tail set, and the curve in front of the tail base. Last, but most certainly not least, evaluate the nutritional effects on structure. Position the puppy facing the mirror. Make sure that the front legs are hanging free without bearing any weight and the puppy is completely relaxed. This shows you the true structure of the front legs. Once you lower it back onto the table, if the front legs lose whatever soundness was seen while suspended, the problem usually is nutritional, not structural. One thing we ask all breeders who bring us litters for evaluation is, what are you feeding the puppies? Premium puppy foods usually contain additional nutrients which can allow the growth rate of bones to increase. However, since there is no way to increase the growth rate of soft tissue, rapid bone growth can create structural problems. Structural problems caused by nutrition are usually correctable by changing to a quality adult maintenance food. However, the change must be made before the growth plates close. After that, nutritionally generated structural problems are irreversible. Finally, Give all puppies the best possible chance at an objective evaluation. Work to keep them calm during the procedure. Some people swing puppies in the air to calm them or act as though they're dropping them off the end of the table. Both of these techniques generally produce the opposite results. We use cheese during an evaluation, not as bait, but simply as a way to keep puppies' minds off of what we're doing. Cheese is easy on their stomachs and keeps their interests. You don't want to use anything that's so enticing that you lose control. Remember they're babies, not adult show dogs. You want to be as soft and gentle with them as possible. In some respects, 
Breeding dogs is a roll of the dice. Breed the best you have to the best you can, and you may still end up disappointed, having to let go of a whole litter and begin again. This is an inherent risk taken by even the most experienced dog breeders. At the same time, making an accurate determination about each puppy's future can be equally difficult unless you're measuring against a standard of excellence that includes structural soundness. When evaluating for temperament, you're looking for any one of four genetic temperament traits. Remember, this only works when the puppy is out of its familiar environment and being handled by a stranger. A puppy that holds on is an insecure puppy. Insecurity manifests itself later as a dog more comfortable and at ease at home than elsewhere. For example, all of us have heard someone at one time or another say, if the judge could come to my house, this dog would be finished. Such a dog is usually insecure. A fearful puppy will open its eyes wide when you tip it down head first a bit in your arms. You'll be able to see the whites of its eyes. You can actually see the fear. A fearful puppy usually grows up with an exaggerated startle response and a greater fear of things. Many times they're also sound sensitive. An aggressive puppy will not let you hold it on its back, no matter how much you try to get it to relax. A puppy that will not meet your eyes usually will not form good human bonding. This kind of puppy makes neither a great show dog nor a great obedience dog. After all, if it won't form attachments with people, it certainly isn't going to try to please them. When you identify any of these traits, socializing and exposure to a variety of positive experiences can help mask them. But the genetic causes of such traits will remain intact. Therefore, write down the traits you identify. Then you will be aware of them if you use a puppy with any of these traits in your breeding program later on. A sound temperament will show itself in puppies that are relaxed and confident that nothing is going to happen to them. That's the kind of temperament you are looking for. Evaluating the head is a very confusing proposition. This is a job for the breeder. When you look at the head of an eight-week-old puppy, if it's what you are looking for in an adult, then you need to find out if it's going to stay that way. In determining how the head will develop, you first want to evaluate the ridge or the zygomatic arch or the cheekbone that runs between the eye and the ear, as well as the areas below and above that ridge. If the surface of that ridge is flat and the areas below and above the ridge are fairly flush with it, then the back skull is most likely going to grow in proportion to what you are looking at. If the lateral surface is not flat or the ridge is curved, the back skull will most likely broaden out of proportion. The curvature of the ridge between the eye and the ear is made up of two bones. The strength of the muscle attachment on the head is what keeps these two bones from separating. The separation of those two bones allows the back skull to broaden. If there is a significant indentation above the ridge, the head will usually develop a dome shape. If your evaluation indicates that the back skull will remain in proportion, ear placement and the shape and placement of the eye will remain proportionately the same as well. If the back skull broadens out of proportion, it can alter the shape and position of the eyes and the position of the ears. In evaluating the head, 
The next feature to check for is a round, pellet-like formation on the skull bone at the inside corner of the eye. It will feel like a small pearl. This round formation is part of the growth plate that controls the width of the muzzle as it grows. If that tiny ball is present, normally the muzzle will grow forward in proportion to what you're looking at. If it is absent and you feel a small indentation instead of a tiny ball, the muzzle will probably narrow. When looking at the mouth, the bite needs to be what your breed standard calls for, but don't stop there. Check the placement of all four canines and check for proper occlusion on the sides. The side teeth fit together like cogs of a wheel or teeth on a pair of pinking shears. If they're misaligned, the mouth can change well into adulthood. This is one of the reasons why good mouths can go bad. If there appears to be a problem with the alignment of the canines, talk to a dental vet about interceptive orthodontics, a perfectly legal option when dealing with puppy teeth. According to one report, interceptive orthodontics is effective in 50% of all cases. In most breeds, the neck is of paramount importance in detecting front assembly problems. If you were to draw a line along the puppy's top line, its head should be well above that line. If it isn't, the puppy has a short neck, which almost always indicates something is not quite right with the front. One possible cause of a short neck is a poorly placed front assembly, which is a very common problem in the dog world today. All dogs have seven vertebrae in their necks. However, an improper placement of the front assembly can cause an x-ray to show only five or six. This is because the shoulder blade itself is actually hiding one or more of the vertebrae. One way to verify a poorly placed front assembly is by the elbows. Place your left hand under the chest and with your index finger and thumb on the elbows, squeeze them together just until you feel resistance. If the elbows come together, the placement of the front assembly is the problem. In such a case, the reason you can move the elbows is because the upper arm is in front of the rib cage instead of alongside the rib cage. This causes a sloppy upper arm movement instead of a good, strong forward action. Another cause of a short neck could be straight shoulders, which we'll discuss shortly. What matters is that a dog with a short neck, whatever the cause, will almost always have less reach because a dog usually can only reach to the end of its nose. So the shorter the neck, the shorter the reach. If you can gently tip the puppy's head all the way back to the shoulders, the puppy probably has a U-neck like a sheep. A dog with a U-neck can compensate for this structural weakness by tucking its head into its body thus giving the appearance of a short neck. Bones have to be balanced to work in unison. Equidistance means the dog will be able to move its front assembly muscles properly. With this in mind, most breeds should have the appearance of approximately the same length from the notch near the point of the shoulder to the top of the blade, as from the notch to the elbow. The shoulder blade should sit at the angle described in your breed standard, which in most cases is referred to as well laid back or 45 degrees. Although there is an enormous amount of controversy 
regarding the feasibility of 45 degree shoulder angles on dogs. Don't allow this controversy to become an excuse for not breeding the best you can. Remember, the straighter the shoulder, the shorter the reach. The shoulder blades should fit smoothly and blend onto the rib cage. They should never be the highest point of the dog. In most breeds, you shouldn't be able to see them and you should hardly be able to feel them. If they fit properly, they will almost always have the proper space between the tips. If the tips are too far apart, the dog will move wide up front. If the tips are too close together, the dog's ability to lower its head will be restricted. And if a dog can't eat out of a pan on the floor without laying down, how is it going to do the job for which it was originally bred, such as retrieve, hunt, or track? Although you constantly hear in the show world about short upper arms, we have found very few of them in our puppy evaluations over the years. We've seen many straight upper arms with and without correct shoulders, but actual short upper arms appear to be a rarity. Straight upper arms can add to a soft top line. With your left hand over the puppy on its shoulder blades, push gently to the side. If this motion pops the elbow out, the dog will throw its elbows as an adult and usually also causes the dog to toe in up front. This is the result of poor muscle attachment and or loose ligaments. The puppy should have a prosternum that you can almost hold on to with your fingers. Since a good prosternum surface is necessary for proper muscle attachment, which links the upper arm to the rib cage, a lack of prosternum may result in a very loose forward movement up front. The depth of the chest at eight weeks should be what it is supposed to be as an adult. If the bottom of the chest is flat, the puppy will usually retain the depth. If it's curved in a finished look or appearance, it will usually outgrow the depth you are feeling. Also, put your hand on the chest between the front legs. If your fingers reach an angle under the ribs, the dog usually will have a herring gut. The depth of the rib should extend to the ninth rib. If it does not, the resulting problem can affect the amount of stamina the dog has as an adult. The puppy's loin is measured from where the last rib comes off of the spine. The distance from the last rib to the pelvis should be shorter than the distance from the last rib to the shoulder. If the puppy's loin is too long, the area between the last rib and the pelvis has no support. Therefore, the dog is going to be more susceptible to top line problems. On the other hand, having too short of a loin is just as serious. All of the dog's ability to bend sideways resides in the loin. Some terriers have gotten so short-backed that they don't have a loin left, so they are incapable of turning in or backing out of a hole. You have to get a shovel to dig them out after they get stuck. As stated earlier, bones have to be balanced to work in unison. Equidistance means the dog will be able to move its rear assembly muscles properly. Insofar as the rear assembly is concerned, the length between the point of the buttocks and the kneecap or patella 
should be approximately the same length as between the kneecap and the hock. Breed standards vary enormously when it comes to rear angulation. From the chow, expected to have a stifle with little angulation and an almost straight hock joint, to the dachshund, expected to have right angles and everything in between. Just remember that at eight weeks, the stifle angle doesn't always show. It generally follows, however, that the sharper the hawk angle, the more stifle angle the puppy will have as an adult. Just be sure you evaluate this piece in relation to your breed standard. Rear assembly balance for most breeds is the same. Imagine dropping a plumb line down from the point of the buttocks to the ground. On a well-balanced, well-structured rear assembly, the plumb would drop right at the toes. This is the balance point required for proper movement. If the rear legs are too long and the feet fall far behind the plumb line, the puppy has sickle hocks. As it moves its feet forward for balance, the hocks appear to bend in the form of a sickle. This will affect the dog's movement, as it will have little or no range of motion behind. All dogs from behind should be shaped like an inverted U. If the puppy you are evaluating is shaped like an inverted V, the puppy usually has a narrow pelvis and will move narrow behind. If the puppy is a bitch, think carefully about whether you want to keep her in your breeding program. A narrow pelvis increases the chance that you'll be paying for more cesarean sections and potentially losing puppies due to prolonged deliveries and delays in electing to perform the C-sections. Generally speaking, the majority of breeds, with a notable exception of bulldogs, should never be narrower at the rear than they are at the shoulders. In most breeds, the kneecap or patella should flow into the body. If you evaluate a puppy whose knees point out, that puppy will be much more susceptible to injuries. Plus, the abnormal weight bearing can result in added stress on the other joints in the rear assembly. Usually, a dog with knees angling out will move wide behind. Luxating patellas or slipped kneecaps are not something we check for. You're much better off leaving that determination to your vet. When you're evaluating the rear, one of the things you look at is which way the rear feet point when you pick up the rear slightly and drop it. If the feet point out, the dog will stand and move as if it were cow hocked, even if the dog is not cow hocked. A spread, barrel, or open hocked dog will toe in behind with hocks out. Both of these problems can be caused by an imbalance of muscle mass on the inside or outside of the leg. All muscles need to be balanced in order to minimize the dog's susceptibility to injury. Hocks are the cornerstone of the rear assembly. The rear pastern should be perpendicular to the ground and the hock joint itself should have no forward or side motion to it. The shorter or more let down a hock is, the more endurance it will have. At eight weeks, the hock should be no more than one third the total height of the dog's rear. A potentially serious hock problem that is far too commonly seen is slipped hocks, also referred to as double jointed or popping hocks. In the evaluation, the puppy with slipped hocks generally will not hold its rear in a stacked position. 
it will constantly be moving a rear leg forward. A slipped hock is when the joint itself bends the wrong direction. It hyperextends or collapses forward. The weakness is in the tissue, not the bone. The reason the puppy moves its leg or legs forward is because the hock joint will not collapse with the legs farther underneath the body. If a puppy has slipped hocks at eight weeks, it almost always has slipped hocks the rest of its life, no matter how it learns to compensate. But how many other problems does that compensation cause? Hip dysplasia is thought to have a substantial genetic component. However, if a dog has a predisposition to hip problems and a joint beneath the hip wears out, the next joint up the line is going to take on more of the burden of balance and movement. When the hock wears out, the knee compensates. When the knee wears out, the hip compensates. Common sense tells us that all structures are composed of balance and compensations. Therefore, be aware that slipped hocks can cause the puppy serious problems later on if the weakness is dismissed. When you are looking at the top line of a puppy or dog, remember that where the bony projections on top of the vertebrae change direction, there is a slight dip. This isn't a hole to be concerned about. A top line problem is very rarely created by the spine. It is usually a compensation issue. Therefore, to really understand the top line, we need to return to the front and rear assemblies. If there is a softness or there are holes in the top line, they usually stem from some problem in the front assembly. For example, if a puppy's front is too far forward, there will usually be a hole directly behind the shoulder blades. If a dog has straight shoulders or straight upper arms, it will usually have a soft top line. Wrinkles over the shoulder usually indicate straight or wide shoulder blades. If there is a roach to the top line where there shouldn't be one, it usually stems from some problem in the rear assembly. Many dogs with slipped hocks will have roached top lines. In order to keep the pressure off of their legs, they try to carry more weight in their backs. You can see the same effect in older dogs that have developed arthritis in their rear assemblies. If in your evaluation of a puppy, you find that the croup and tail set are bad, you need to know that they'll probably never get better. If they're good, however, they can get worse over the next two years of the puppy's life. The determining factors are the three vertebrae between the hip and the tail set. These vertebrae fuse together and they are the last bones in the body to calcify. The croup and tail set are dependent not only on the attitude of the dog, but also on the rear structure. The weaker the structure is behind, or the less chance a dog has to run in wide open spaces, the greater your chances of losing a proper croup and tail set. On an eight week old puppy, you want to see a tail set that's appropriate with respect to your breed standard. With a tail that is supposed to be held up, you want to see a shelf or a protrusion of the buttocks behind the base of the tail. Exerting a slight forward pressure at the base of the tail should produce a 90 degree angle from the top line to the tail set. With a tail that isn't supposed to be held up, you want the base of the tail to be a straight line down the rear. Also, at the intersection of the top line and the tail, you want a curve. If the tail set 
or the rear is too high, check the point of the buttocks. This bone should feel like it's parallel with the ground. If it angles up, the puppy could have a tipped pelvis. In a bitch, this could contribute to whelping problems. We do not evaluate movement in eight-week-old puppies. They are going to move however their brains tell them to, and brains aren't always in full communication with legs at eight weeks of age, especially in male puppies. It's more important to watch puppies on the ground because the way puppies use and carry their bodies, in other words, the way they naturally present themselves, generally stays with them throughout their lives. The puppy on the ground who seems to say, just look at me, I'm fabulous, will almost always keep that kind of attitude. The one who walks around with its head tucked and shoulders slumped will usually grow up with that kind of attitude. Also, the most difficult thing for any animal to do is to stand still. The same is true for people. In order for a dog to be comfortable standing still, it has to be well made and balanced. So the puppy that stands proud without fidgeting is in all likelihood the most well-structured puppy in the litter. The more structurally imbalanced a puppy is, the more it's in motion. Additionally, the best built puppies usually trot. The ones that bunny hop usually have the greater number of structural weaknesses. The size and substance of an eight week old puppy mean very little. The smallest puppy in the litter can turn out to be the biggest dog and vice versa. However, a puppy should weigh what you think it's going to weigh. This has to do with bone density. And if bone density is out of balance with the rest of the puppy, it can grow up either spindly or clunky. Remember, physical structure is all about compensation and balance. The three most important reasons to evaluate litters of puppies you have bred are number one, to determine whether there are structural problems. If there's a structural problem, search out the cause. You can't fix anything in a breeding program until you know specifically what needs to be fixed. It doesn't do any good to look at a dog and say, I don't like that rear, unless you know why you don't like it and what is needed to improve it. Number two, to determine which puppies to keep in your breeding program. Use all elements of the formula for success. In other words, consider the results of your structural evaluation in conjunction with breed type, coat, color, and preferences. Number three, to determine what kind of home is most suitable for each puppy that leaves you. It's up to you as the breeder, to make a match between a prospective buyer's lifestyle and the puppy whose structural qualities are most compatible. There is no substitute for careful, responsible breeding. The only thing more important is to put the welfare of the puppies you breed before all else when making your decisions about where and how they will spend the rest of their lives. It's in our hands as the caretakers of the dog breeds we hold dear. <laughs>